everyone and uh, welcome to new discussion which we are going to have on hyperspectral remote sensing uh, under this uh, remote sensing essentials course. Earlier uh, we have touched a little bit about uh, hyperspectral remote sensing, but today we are going to uh, um, focus mainly on this uh, discussion and uh, that uh, what is exactly hyperspectral remote sensing and uh, what are the applications and some limitations also which we are going to discuss. As you know that uh, you know uh, hyperspectral remote sensing uh, is also considered as imaging spectrometry or imaging spectroscopy uh, because here um, the bandwidth is uh, really in nanometers. So, very narrow bands are used here one and also you are having a, a coverage of continuous uh, coverage of the EM spectrum uh, against this uh, hyperspectral uh, sensor. So, therefore, it is uh, uh, called as imaging spectrometry or is Im imaging spectroscopy. Uh, because uh, hyperspectral that means uh, we are having hundreds of bands sometimes even 256 bands in one sensor having a very thin uh, width uh, there. So, when, when this is the situation too many bands or excessive bands we call as hyperspectral remote sensing and uh, we can also have thousands of bands further narrow bands and then we will call ultra spectral. So far uh, there are no sensors yet uh, in uh, ultra spectral remote sensing, but definitely there are sensors which, uh, which, are, in, which are part of uh, hyper spectral remote sensing that means hundreds of bands. So, the uh, whatever the reflected or emitted radiation that can be measured uh, earlier when if you recall in since 1972 when we started Landsat uh, MSS we had just 4 bands covering a large part of EM spectrum that large part including visible and uh, uh, near infrared infrared and only we had 4 bands and those bands were quite relatively now if we compare with today's uh, reference then these were uh, quite broad bands were there. And uh, these bands were of course continuous at that time for Landsat MSS but uh, very wide bands were there. Now, we are talking very fine spectral resolution rather than uh, relatively coarser resolution. We are uh, talking now very fine spectral resolution and not only uh, very fine bands, but also continuous coverage of uh, that part of EM spectrum. So, hyperspectral remote sensing basically these systems uh, detects uh, 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 data in hundreds of spectral bands of a very narrow sometimes uh, 5 to 10 nanometer uh, and uh, that too simultaneously in uh, hundreds of bands. And these uh, with such detail if we are having about a part of uh, earth or uh, even now moon or mars uh, then we, we can identify uh, many various things which were impossible with the broad uh, spectral bands and especially related with minerals or changes in vegetation or maybe related with atmospheric uh, uh, constituents. So, we are going to uh, discuss all those in the application part and uh, hyperspectral remote sensing also allows a more specific analysis for land cover as I have just mentioned that. Uh, uh, if there are different types of soils, rocks, minerals, vegetation, plants, trees or uh, uh, crops which are suffering from some kind of uh, you know stresses all these can be detected with hyperspectral remote sensing because you are having continuous bands and very narrow bands available throughout uh, a large part of EM spectrum. When we go for this uh, thermal part that is the emissivity levels of each band can be combined to form a spectral reflectance curve. And uh, these uh, curves we have earlier also uh, discussed as spectral response curve or reflectance curve. So, depends on uh, where in which part of EM spectrum we are talking. Generally, the sensors which have been developed uh, in hyperspectral domain of remote sensing are in the mainly in the visible 
uh, near infrared and infrared part rather than in thermal remote sensing. So, if we compare with multispectral remote sensing versus hyperspectral remote sensing, as you can see here, that uh, these bands in multispectral remote sensing are uh, in discrete form. That means uh, uh, it is difficult to create a spectral response curve as we are seeing here against the um, against the uh, hyperspectral remote sensing. So here we will have just a few uh, say few responses. Now in terms of say in this example reflectance, and if we connect, we may get. Uh, uh, close uh, you know is curve close to this one, but not uh, uh, that fine detailing will not be possible multispectral remote sensing. However, when we go for hyperspectral remote sensing as you can see here that the bands are continuous, bands are continuous throughout and therefore, uh, there are hundreds of bands and therefore, it is possible to create a continuous uh, a spectral response curve as you are seeing here. Whereas, a uh, multispectral will provide a discrete bands or discrete curve though by interpolations you can create. So, therefore, you are in between uh, two bands you are having a gap, but here uh, there is uh, no gap at all in hyperspectral remote sensing. So, continuous coverage is uh, possible. So, when, when we have been talking about uh, uh, you know broadband then uh, uh, you know then only visible and uh, short wave infrared part was covered. In case of multispectral when we went broadband one of the best example can be panchromatic sense bands like in IRS uh, 1C 1D we had the panchromatic camera or in other sensors also we are having even in Landsat uh, uh, latest series we are having panchromatic band. Generally these panchromatic band in hyper multispectral remote sensing are very broad. But uh, when we go for hyperspectral remote sensing, then we can have hundred uh, tens of bands in uh, different parts of EM spectrum as we are seeing here, hundreds of bands in hyperspectral. Compared to this in multispectral, we will have like 0.45 to 0.52 micrometer, 0.52 to 62 micrometer and likewise. So, these bands compared to hyperspectral are uh, relatively broadband, but uh, if we go for visible part uh, like panchromatic camera then those are the broadest uh, are there. And uh, if we talk about hyperspectral as I have said so far no sensors are there, then we are going to have within the same part of EM spectrum that means from here to here we are going to have instead of hundreds of bands we are going to have thousands of bands. So, uh, this is this is the advantage uh, of hyperspectral remote sensing so that it covers the continuous uh, continuously the entire spectrum and for uh, 5 to 10 nanometer you are having one band uh, each time. Uh, if, we, if we further uh, think in terms uh, in this differences between multispectral and hyperspectral as, uh, uh, as uh, discussed. Uh, uh, in the uh, previous slides that uh, multispectral you are having only discrete information and then using this discrete information one can create a curve or hyper that uh, response curve. But in hyperspectral uh, you get a continuous curve uh, for different uh, minerals or uh, land coverage. Uh, in this case like kaolinite and uh, kaolinite is a, a clay mineral and gypsum is a mineral, alunite is a mineral, dolomite uh, uh, then uh, you are having calcite mineral, chloride mineral. So, all these uh, minerals, rocks, vegetation they, they you can have a very good uh, continuous curves, a spectral response curve for their uh, you know identification with high level of confidence. But if I am having multispectral data the situation is like this, the data is discrete data is not continuous and uh, uh, minimum identification is possible. In case of continuous bands like in hyperspectral uh, we are having maximum identification is possible and the level of confidence in multispectral relatively will be low whereas uh, in hyperspectral it is going to be very high. And uh, uh, when we go for classification of multispectral images or creating these uh, standard curves then the knowledge 
field knowledge and uh, further analysis in the lab is very much required. Whereas uh, here, uh, a database which has been created through hyperspectral remote sensing can be used directly, and uh, this uh, spectral unmixing uh, is uh, there. That means uh, we get very distinct uh, uh, characteristics of different land cover uh, features or land features which are present there. Like uh, here, examples are shown uh, starting from uh, chloride to kaolinite. Further, uh, when we uh, see this, uh, these comparisons between multispectral and hyperspectral, and uh, that is separated spectral bands in case of multispectral, and in case of hyperspectral does not have any separate uh, spectral gaps because the bands are continuous. One ends, another starts. Whereas in multispectral, there might be some gap depending on the atmospheric window conditions. So that is why. Uh, in uh, there are gaps uh, there or separated bands are there. Uh, in case of multispectral, we are having wider bandwidth. Of course, it's a na very narrow bandwidth, only maybe five to ten nanometer, and hundreds of bands are there. Coarse representation of spectral signatures, whereas here it's a complete representation. Instead of discrete in case of multispectral, here we are having a complete representation, a continuous representation of spectral signatures of different features on uh, land, uh, land surface. And uh, it sometimes it with multispectral sensors or data, it is, uh, uh, it is, it is uh, uh, possible that uh, these small differences in spectral curves may not be picked up. But uh, in case of hyperspectral uh, remote sensing or images or data be it is capable of to detect uh, subtle spectral uh, features. So, because uh, you are having um, hundreds of bands one and you are having continuous bands and therefore, uh, your spectral curves are very very good and therefore, uh, their detection of different features becomes much easier. And uh, there are you know obviously, there will be some trade off. So, trade off here is multispectral the data volume is smaller in relative to uh, in case of hyperspectral remote sensing lot of data large volume of data or nowadays a new term is used the big data. So, you are you are having in hyperspectral remote sensing the big data to analyze whereas in multispectral you may be having uh, you know 4, 5, 10 or even in like a uh, a modest sensor you are having 36 bands. So, these are the maximum number of bands which are in possible in multispectral remote sensing which are uh, operational sensors I am talking. But in hyperspectral you will have 256 band, 100 bands or maybe more bands and therefore, the large volume of data analysis has to be done. So, that is uh, one uh, trade off one can argue. And uh, of course, the fewer problems with the calibrations are there because we know which part of EM spectrum and which um, uh, where the atmospheric windows are there. And therefore, these problems will be very minimum with multispectral remote sensing. However, with the hyperspectral remote sensing, radiometric and spectral calibrations are really time consuming. So, it is not relatively not easy all the time to use um, hyperspectral data. There are other issues are also there like availability of hyperspectral data. Multispectral data for entire globe from different sensors of different countries nowadays available free of cost on net. But uh, such data sets of, of hyperspectral remote sensing are not easily available. If we see and uh, this uh, hyperspectral remote sensing this is called the cube basically cube that on the front you are having only one um, um, one band image you are seeing. But uh, in the depth or in the jet direction you are having spectral bands and hundreds of bands and therefore, you are having uh, continuous uh, slices of 5 to 10 nanometer width of, of bands are there. So, uh, basically with this uh, imaging spectrometer uh, basically it is started uh, with the um, microscopic level, but now we have gone to uh, in a satellite based like uh, here this is the example of 224 spectral images taken simultaneously of different part of EM spectrum. Uh, 
and uh, when when these are uh, you know different features are looked through like a uh, first example is the water body then this is how the spectral curve in diff uh, different parts of em spectrum one is going to have so uh, you know the water body then soil you are having of course atmosphere including atmosphere is there then water is there and then vegetation is there and each of these objects which are present on the land surface will have different response curves so spectra of two materials or spectra among uh, of different materials with very different characteristics which you can see because of uh, different reflect and uh, reflection absorption properties uh, and when uh, sense with the wide band in case of multispectral one may not uh, uh, one may not be able to discriminate between different objects but when these the same objects are seen through uh, hyperspectral remote sensing then through this continuous spectrum uh, of spatial elements is analyzed then it is possible to detect each and every type of objects which are present there even the variations like variations within the vegetation variation within the water bodies variation within the atmospheric constituents all those variations can also be picked up through hyperspectral remote sensing uh, hyperspectral image analysis when we come to this analysis part because the data is enormous it's a really big data and, uh, and though the swath generally of hyperspectral images is very narrow relatively but nonetheless the number of bands are enormous so this uh, analysis of hyperspectral remote sensing derived uh, uh, the uh, in the field of spectroscopy and uh, which relates to molecular composition of particular material with respect to corresponding absorption and reflection pattern of light at individual wavelength wavelength because we are having continuous bands and therefore it is possible and uh, to go to that extent to study uh, different uh, objects uh, and uh, this uh, this uh, the spectral response curve or the spectral information of known material uh, can be collected and these can become sort of standards uh, in our library and whenever we get a new curves we can compare with the existing uh, library and uh, then identification of uh, such objects or uh, uh, such uh, 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 such uh, materials which are present uh, becomes much easier so uh, libraries are being created nowadays uh, about hyperspectral uh, of different minerals of different soils of different vegetations different conditions of water bodies and different atmospheric constituents and these libraries after uh, certain iterations becomes a standard library and therefore these can be used to compare and the new data sets and identification becomes much much easier another approach uh, uh, is a spectral ratioing that means when we go for ratioing and uh, we are going to reduce the number of bands and get a index a index uh, like wind ratioing or vegetation index and other things so then uh, another approach in the analysis of uh, hyperspectral remote sensing is go for ratioing which is dividing every uh, reflectance value in the reflectance spectrum by the another band and by which uh, if we are having 100 bands if we create ratios among them then we may end up with 50 bands so that and uh, things can become much easier to handle and uh, which are the sensor which are uh, operational so let's see like uh, everis uh, is one uh, which is uh, uh, covering part of uh, visible and infrared imaging spectrometer and uh, this is uh, nasa's airborne sensor not satellite based airborne one has to be little uh, aware about this and uh, there are 224 bands and uh, the part of a spectrum which is being covered is visible and infrared that means 0.4 micrometer to 2.5 micrometer so within this uh, uh, band uh, of uh, visible and infrared and uh, there are 224 bands continuous bands of very narrow uh, thickness and uh, which flies on er2 uh, or low altitude uh, twin otter the name of the aircraft 
So, uh, the Everest uh, was one of the first uh, hyperspectral sensors developed by NASA and it was of course airborne. And uh, some, par uh, some part of US were covered by this and data became available. And uh, later on then Hyperion uh, which is on board of U1 satellite. So, this is really a satellite based rather than airborne space based uh, uh, sensor Hyperion which data is available and data is in 220 uh, bands and uh, again the band width uh, in which these 220 bands are located is the same as in case of Everest that is 0.4 uh, to 2.5 micrometer and uh, the, uh, uh, you know this has to be uh, considered here the swath. The swath width is just 7.5 and length is 100 kilometer. So, one scene will cover a very narrow or tiny part of the earth though contain with continuous bands and 220 bands and for a very small part of EM spectrum starting from 0.4 that is invisible part to infrared part that is up to 2.5. So, within that part of EM spectrum 220 bands continuous bands are there, but with very narrow swath. The, the problem is the data these 220 bands they will create enormous data and the same time the satellite uh, and the sensor on board of the EOS 1 has to transmit that data towards the earth very quickly and therefore, the swath cannot be kept uh, uh, very broad. So, very narrow swath is possible Hyperion data for some parts of the world are now available and this uh, Hyperion was developed uh, first having um, experience uh, about Everest by the NASA and they, they tested first developed the sensor tested airborne and uh, when uh, uh, you know uh, there was it was successful then it went on board of satellite and uh, a new sensor was named as Hyperion. Now, this uh, basically is uh, for a uh, technology demonstration and of course, a uh, lot of testing are being done lot of people are started using uh, this data sets and uh, some parts of India have also been covered by Hyperion, but the problem remain about the swath width very narrow swath. So, Hyperion uh, basically as I have just mentioned that is his own NASA uh, earth observing satellite 1. Uh, which is uh, demonstrating new sensor technology the purpose of uh, this mission was and uh, the sensor is push broom sensor a uh, little older technology in that sense and uh, the altitude wise is 7.5 uh, 705 kilometer and uh, swath width is of course about 7.6 kilometer swath width uh, and near polar orbit as normal remote sensing satellites flying in formation with the lens at uh, one minute apart so that uh, we get coverage in multispectral as well as in hyperspectral at the same time. So, comparisons can be made because the main purpose is to demonstrate the new technology new sensor technology and therefore, it has been designed like this that um, one minute before uh, uh, it one mi minute apart it will cover the same part of the earth and a spectral range is of course, we have discussed 0.4 or other 0.43 to 2.4 micrometer and 10 and nanometer bandwidth is there and which is covering uh, visible and infrared part of EM spectrum 220 bands continuous bands are there. Spatial resolution this is another point uh, which we must think that a spatial though spectral resolution has increased significantly or rather tremendously rather than having 4 bands, 10 bands or even 36 bands in case of MODIS sensor. Here we are having 220 bands, but spectral resolution remained around 30 meter with most of these hyperspectral uh, remote sensing. So, that one may consider as, uh, as swath width and spe spatial resolution one may consider as the limit uh, you know limitations of hyperspectral remote sensing, but at the same time the spectral resolution has increased tremendously has improved tremendously. The quantization or radiometric resolution is 12 bit which is quite good and uh, because it is after all to detect uh, minute differences in the uh, 
uh, uh, you know objects which are present on the surface of that may be minute differences in minerals and uh, respect uh, spectrum spectral response carbo may be soils or in vegetation and therefore and uh, this uh, uh, 12 bit uh, quantization is very much uh, required and uh, what are the applications where this hyper spectral remote sensing can be applied i have uh, we have uh, touched little bit about uh, those things but here we will be uh, going in much details the applications so if we start like uh, in the atmosphere water vapor and different densities of water vapor so water vapor mapping can be done for that part of of course earth where for which the hyper spectral remote sensing data is available and maybe for mineral mapping that is very very much required because uh, these broadband uh, or multi spectral sensors sometimes uh, we are not capable of detecting minute differences in minerals a uh, mine tailing uh, monitoring because in mining areas lot of uh, you know waste or during the process a lot of waste uh, is uh, discharged and uh, so those things can also be detected very clearly using hyper spectral remote sensing uh, in soil studies soil fraction studies it is possible to use hyper spectral remote sensing again in the canopy as i have said that uh, in case of vegetation so water content may be leaf area index that is chlorophyll uh, concentration also there and uh, then you can have uh, crown closures that how and uh, the top of uh, these uh, trees are uh, there and uh, their spectral curves can also be developed and of course different types of uh, clay minerals like kaolinite and Mont Mondrianite, all those clay minerals can also be identified uh, very easily. So these are the some of the applications of hyper spectral remote sensing, like in mineral or oil exploration. It is possible in oil exploration only if it, it is possible if there is a, uh, a spill or slippage uh, on the surface or on the water body. Then uh, it happens in many cases, and therefore it is possible to detect. whether it's a natural oil which is coming from uh, beneath the earth in case of water body or on the earth in case of on the land part mineral mineral deposits there might be some gozans or some mineral deposits which might be some signatures on the surface of the earth and uh, if we are having hyper spectral remote sensing then minute uh, differences can be detected through these continuous band so in mineral exploration oil explorations a uh, hyper spectral remote sensing is playing major role in of course in agriculture and uh, different conditions of plants or crops can be identified very easily with these continuous bands and uh, through hyper spectral remote sensing environment related studies especially in the atmospheric part and then surveillance also uh, my hyper spectral remote sensing uh, can be employed chemical imaging mean mainly in case of pollution related studies like here mine tailings or pollution in the rivers or pollution in the sea part so that kind of chemical imaging is also possible this is not of course exhaustive list so lot of uh, other applications are uh, are also being developed as the data becomes uh, uh, available more easily uh, for entire globe more new applications will come in future a uh, few more uh, you know points which i would like to mention here about hyper applications of hyper spectral remote sensing when we say about atmosphere then what are those constituents for which hyper spectral remote sensing can be employed and uh, like uh, water vapor cloud properties aerosols and uh, that is uh, uh, very very important uh, because aerosols are and uh, creating lot of uh, changes in the atmosphere or in climate and, uh, and not only uh, the changing aerosols is itself is a problem but the effect of these aerosols are uh, might be outgoing long wave radiation is getting affected and many other things are happening so it is possible to measure uh, measure and map and uh, through hyper spectral remote sensing these aerosols if we talk in ecology then chlorophyll leaf area leaf water cellulose pigments 
and the lignin, lignin, all these things can be studied through hyperspectral remote sensing. If we talk about geology, then mineral and soil types and uh, where the clay will play important role when we discuss about soil types. Of course, mineral deposits, oil deposits, all those can be identified based on if surface signatures are available. In coastal waters like in chemical mapping as I mentioned earlier, uh, maybe chlorophyll, uh, phytoplanktons, dissolved organic materials, suspended sediments, and there may be many, many things say in coastal or uh, lake waters and those things in where these uh, hyperspectral remote sensing can be applied. Of course, in glaciers also people have started using hyperspectral remote sensing. So, a, a snow cover fraction whether uh, what is the density of snow, whether a snow is fresh and what is the content of water and that uh, for that purpose of course, hyperspectral remote sensing can play a major role. Then grain size of the individual snow grains there also it can be applied and melting of course mm, is there. Then biomass burning. This is a, a very a, you know common especially in month of November, early December in a, a western part of India, Punjab, Haryana and western UP uh, where a lot of biomass burning is there after the this paddy crop and uh, this uh, creates a lot of aerosols in the atmosphere and uh, basically after some time and there is the and the aerosols which are pumped through this bio biomass bio, bio bio burning add uh, aerosols in the atmosphere and since uh, during that time of the year we do not have much wind at all. So, those aerosols will remain for some more time in the atmosphere will create problems in, uh, in the atmosphere and also in the uh, creating more fog over uh, this part of the country. So, aerosols uh, and uh, this biomass burning, they, they have got direct linkage and plays very important role. Hyperspectral remote sensing can be employed to measure or map aerosols uh, uh, after this bio na, biomass burning. In a commercial uh, side of applications, mineral expressions, agriculture and forest production and there it, it can be applied. So, in uh, if I go uh, for a geological applications like in mineral exploration, the basic idea here is the using hyperspectral remote sensing to distinguish uh, different spectral uh, features or minerals uh, in different part of EM spectrum, uh, maybe in infrared or short wave infrared region uh, because of uh, a bending stretching feature of uh, OH, uh, OH uh, this uh, CO3, uh, aluminum and uh, uh, other uh, bearing uh, minerals are there, they can be distinguished very easily. Uh, this is one of the examples of uh, uses of hyperspectral remote sensing and after that the classification has been performed and uh, here uh, different uh, minerals one can identify. These are the Fe iron bearing minerals uh, which have been identified here like uh, jessorite, hematite, goethite and uh, some trace uh, iron bearing minerals are also there. And uh, sometimes you may end up with no detection also, it is not all the time to detect each and every uh, feature or land surface uh, which is present there. So, there might be some no detection areas also. So, it is uh, possible these things have been confirmed by XRD analysis and uh, uh, these uh, spectral retrieval sites are also mentioned there. So, these can become your standard curves also after XRD analysis. So, the confirmation can be done through that one and then these curves becomes more or less a standard. So, in future uh, campaign of hyperspectral remote sensing or future images if uh, uh, curve is matched with the standard library curves then one can easily identify different minerals. Uh, of the uh, past experience of others. And uh, it is a wide variety and in, or, in order to detect and map with wide variety of materials having a, a characteristic reflectance curve. For example, to detect and map minerals uh, where hyperspectral remote sensing to detect uh, soil properties including moisture, 
organic content, salinity, etc. People have, uh, different people have done the work and their references are also mentioned here. Uh, and uh, this Clark et al. in 1995, they have identified vegetation species uh, to map the extent of uh, different plant species uh, that can be done to study plant canopy chemistry and determine the concentration of leaf chemicals that has been done uh, by uh, Eber and Martin in 1995 to detect vegetation stress, whether vegetation is suffering from some problems or uh, water stress or some mineral stress that can also be studied through hyperspectral. Military vehicles uh, movement that can also be detected and uh, then area con uh, you know contaminated by mine tailings or other pollutants those can also be detected. And uh, also hyperspectral remote sensing can be employed to detect the water color, to map the water color to uh, basically to uh, determine uh, which microorganisms are present and uh, locate uh, pollution sources. So, lot of applications are there. The only requirement which I am mean mentioning is the availability of the data for entire globe. Because it is a huge data, it is a big data, analysis is also not as easy as hyperspectral and therefore, uh, if data becomes available, lot of new applications uh, will also come. This is an example of exploration geology uh, where different minerals uh, uh, you know are there like uh, porphyrite, calcite, muscovite, gypsum all these having different curves and uh, different uh, clay minerals are there kaolinite, montmorillonite, aluminite, aluminite all these will have different curves uh, uh, when you see in a continuous uh, spectral fashion. But uh, if we take the bands and in gaps in band we get the only dots rather than continuous curves. So, identification becomes much much easier this is what. In case of uh, vegetation application if they are having some stress then there will be a shift in, in the red edge and that can be detected through hyperspectral remote sensing. If I am having uh, you know multiple uh, coverages means say in temporal resolution is if high then it is possible. Because uh, in uh, vegetation and uh, this uh, sharp reflectance changes occurs if vegetation is suffering from some stress or water related stress or some minerals or some disease and uh, then there is a shift uh, in 680 to uh, 750 nanometer part of uh, uh, that um, uh, vegetation spectral curve and that can be detected. So, it is called red edge wavelength and uh, which is in part of near infrared. So, it moves towards the left side in the curve and uh, if those changes uh, are uh, assigned as a that vegetation is suffering from stress because the chlorophyll content which is very high in infrared the reflection of chlorophyll is very high in infrared suddenly changes towards the uh, visible and there is a red shift and in the red, uh, in the edge and uh, it can be detected. Crop identification inventory based on solely or spectra that has been done and so different agricultural feeds are there like uh, barley, oat, uh, canola, other parts, spinach and those things can be detected based on these curves which have been developed through hyperspectral remote sensing. Mineral detection as I have just uh, uh, discussed that this is possible very easily. Also one more example that this is true color image uh, not really a hyperspectral image but the next two and uh, these two are the hyperspectral data and you can see that how identification of different uh, feature or different uh, land covers becomes much easier with hyperspectral remote sensing. And uh, this is uh, this demonstrate the swath basically also and different curves which are there especially along the water body. So, water clarity uh, or the T tube uh, analysis is possible with hyperspectral remote sensing. And so, it is river airborne along the river the flight has been taken. So, different uh, uh, stages or different uh, water clarity can be identified very easily. Also sampling sites have also been taken here to confirm uh, the uh, you know the water clarity which has been detected through hyperspectral remote sensing.
So, in case of water, in case of mineral, in case of atmosphere, in case of vegetation, everywhere hyperspectral remote sensing can be used. So, uh, basically in the end of this discussion, I would like to uh, mention once again uh, uh, to you know uh, in, the, in the end of this one that uh, uh, though hyperspectral remote sensing provides uh, uh, you know hundreds of bands in a continuous fashion, uh, but there are some limitations uh, like uh, the swath bit is uh, not very wide it is just 7.4 or 7.5 kilometer. So, very narrow strip of the earth is covered. The uh, for data for continuous and or for entire globe is also not available. And uh, of, of course, the spatial resolution is not so high as compared to multispectral remote sensing. But nonetheless, they, uh, if the data is available for any part of the globe, maybe of even uh, you know the swath width of 7.5 kilometer, then still lot of work can be done related with all these things whether atmosphere, minerals, water, vegetation etc. So, this brings to the end of uh, this discussion and uh, thank you very much. Music